All right. So my name is Margaret Kelly. I'm the branch librarian at the East Boston Branch Library, and we are very excited to have you here tonight um, for our program with Lyle. So um, some of you I know are East Boston residents. Um, I think there may be a lot of people from Situate tonight, so I would welcome everybody, um, but especially nice to see um, some people coming in from other communities in Boston. Uh, as many of you from East Boston know, the library is open right now for um, some limited services, uh, EPL books to go. Uh, I know Situate is open for picking up books and a little bit of browsing. So um, you lucky Situate people who get to go into your library. I wish, uh, I wish all our East Boston people could come into ours. Uh, but unfortunately, um, not yet. So um, I'd like to welcome you again. Uh, this program is sponsored by both the Friends of the East Boston Branch Library and also by, um, by the East Boston Historical um, Society. So um, we thank them both for um, sponsoring this program. Um, Lyle um, came to us um, with this program um, about both shipbuilding, which is a really important part of East Boston's history, and also um, suffragists, which is something that I haven't heard a lot about um, East Boston suffragists. So um, we are quite excited about that. Um, and so um, I'd like to introduce Lyle. Lyle is uh, a resident of Situate. He is the author of a book, Summer Suffragist Activist in Situate um, in Massachusetts. Um, and it's available on Amazon. The library will be buying a copy at some point, but we don't have it in our system yet. Um, but we hope to soon. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Lyle, okay? Thanks, Lyle. Give me one second and let me, there we go. Great, okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and talk about the uh, history of shipbuilding in East Boston. It had a great reputation and uh, it's been covered before, but I wanna dig below the surface a little bit. And the topic of those two topics you might think is uh, suffragists and shipbuilders, but they're intimately connected and you'll find out when we, go through this all. Um, I should mention that shipbuilding was um, a big part of East Boston's history and it really took off in the 1850s uh, with the building of the clipper ships. They had to be fast, they had to get to China and get that tea from China and get it back here as quick as possible because it, uh, it was not getting any better with age. And also they wanted to get to market. So the, the ones with the first crop of tea from China would get a premium on the market. So that was very important. Uh, also the discovery of gold in California uh, led to a lot of shipbuilding. And so the 1850s were really the um, golden era of shipbuilding in East Boston, but it continued, and this surprised me a bit, it continued on for quite a few decades after that. And we'll cover some of the ships built in those times. Uh, it's so much fun to see these ships, uh, their paintings and so forth are just uh, uh, terrific and really sights to behold. And um, so now I've got a presentation to talk to you about on uh, PowerPoint. So if you'll bear with me, I will try to get this up and running. And I should add that every that a lot of people, even myself, before I knew anything about this subject. Uh, a lot of people had heard about Donald McKay, and he's certainly uh, a, a really key uh, shipbuilder in East Boston, but there were others too, and I think they've been kind of uh, left outside of the limelight, so we'll cover some of those. And that's really how I got involved in this topic. So um, I want to give some, uh, <laughs> I want to thank the sponsors for this. I want to give a shout out to some other people who are important. The Boston Public Library has a great collection of maps at the Leventhal Map Center, and we'll be using uh, some of those maps in this presentation. Uh, the Mass Historical Society and the Dexbury Rural and Historical Society both have papers from uh, Judith Wilson and Sylvanus 
Judith Wilson, uh, Smith and Savannah Smith that uh, really helped generate uh, this talk tonight. The Situate Historical Society also has some records and they've been my home society for quite a while now. And then the Mass Historical uh, Commission has been a place where I've been, uh, I not only use some of their historical research, but I'm providing some historical research to their database called MACRIS, M-A-C-R-I-S. You can Google it and uh, look to your heart's content there. There's lots of good information there. And the State Library of Massachusetts has some great um, maps too that we'll be looking at. So thanks to our sponsors and please consider donating to them. Now, uh, I want to, here's what I want to cover is how did I get involved in this subject? Uh, who were these people? Uh, what did they do? Where did they live and work? And where, um, why are they important? Uh, as to the first question, I, I got to give you my disclaimers, which is I'm not from East Boston. I'm not an expert on shipbuilding and I'm definitely not an expert on Zoom, but I'll try to do my best here. Um, so how did I get involved? Um, well, I wrote a book. You see the cover of it on the left of the screen here. And it was about the self suffragists who spent summers in Situate um, here on the south shore of, of uh, Boston. And it turns out mo many of them were nationally uh, significant. Uh, they spent summers here, but of course my work was to find out why were they important suffragists, where did they work, and where did they live. And um, I found a, a key couple named Sylvanus and Judith Smith who came from the South Shore and settled in East Boston in 1852 and then spent summers uh, from at least the 1870s until their deaths. Um, they spent their summers in Situate, including at the lighthouse in Situate. So that, this, this was a key find. Uh, I stumbled across them and their papers at the Duxbury Research, uh, Rural and Historical Society. And it was just a great, uh, a great find and really an inspiration for me to write the book. Uh, Sylvanus was a key shipbuilder in East Boston. Uh, and it turns out there were many others from the South Shore who joined him in building ships there. And I was curious about where, um, oops, uh, I was curious about uh, where these shipyards were in East Boston, because nobody had really put this stuff together that I could find. Um, so um, just to mention a bit about talking about maps, on the left is a map showing Boston, and then the bottom right corner is Plymouth. And you can see Situate's about halfway between the two. Situate has a nice harbor. It's actually a good harbor uh, and a good place of refuge between Boston and Plymouth in case of storms. And uh, the Smiths kids used to like to sail down from East Boston to Situate. That was one way to get there. Uh, Judith and Sylvanus tended to saddle up their or hitch up their horses to their wagons and drive down to Situate for the summers. Uh, but they could also take the train because there were connections to um, Situate in, starting about 1870. Uh, and I should mention for those who are not from East Boston, there were ferries that would take you across the water to uh, Boston proper that ran pretty often. So it was a very convenient, a very cheap way uh, to, to commute back and forth between East Boston and Boston back in the old days. And so you see on the, on the right um, is a kind of a blown up map of, of Situate with some of the suffragists uh, superimposed on it. And they were, um, uh, they are covered in chapters in my book, but Judith and Sylvanus in the upper right there are uh, subject are the subject of my uh, of one ch a full chapter there one of my favorite chapters too I should say. Now uh, here's a picture of them to uh, the two of them uh, later in life. Um, uh, Sylvanus was born in Duxbury. He worked uh, as a actually at a house builder off and on in Boston and other places and then began, began building ships on the North River in Pembroke, which is the next town over from Duxbury. And he actually lived uh, not too far from the shipyards at uh, the Brick Kiln Shipyard, which is a significant shipyard on the North River. 
uh, that had been the site of shipbuilding since colonial times. And uh, for those of you in East Boston, of course, you'll know that the shipbuilding centers all moved from places like the North River to, to East Boston in the 1830s to 1840s. Um, so, so Sylvanus will talk about uh, more in detail. And later on, we'll talk about Judith, who was actually born in Marshfield, another South Shore town, uh, taught school in Duxbury. I believe that's where she met her husband. They got married in 1841. And from the start, both were interested in the abolition movement. Uh, they were early members of uh, Theodore Parker's church, uh, which was an offshoot of the Unitarian church. And they were also um, key suffragists from an early age. And actually, uh, we'll touch on this later, but Sylvanus was one of the first to hold a key office in one of the suffrage uh, organizations in East Boston. Um, but Judith wound up being uh, one of the most important suffragists in America, really overlooked because she was friends with some of the most important suffragists of the time. So uh, let's talk about key shipbuilders. On the left is Donald McKay. Every, a lot of people know about him. He came down from Canada and uh, started building ships in uh, Newburyport and then eventually moved to East Boston about 1844. But actually before that um, was the, um, uh, the shipbuilder called Samuel Hall and I've shown his picture here. Uh, and he was also from the South Shore. Now I've listed these guys um, as you can see, Samuel Hall came to uh, East Boston in 1839, but he came from Marshfield and Duxbury, he was a big ship builder there, but wanted his own shipyard and then moved up to East Boston. Paul Curtis was actually born in Situate. He worked in Medford, which was another key uh, shipbuilding community until moving to uh, East Boston in 1851. And he lasted until 1873. So all these guys worked for quite a long time in East Boston. And finally, Sylvanus Smith, uh, as I mentioned, came from Duxbury, Pembroke. He also worked in Medford for a while <clears throat> next to the river at shipyards and came to East Boston in 1854. Um, the first three guys during the high, high period of the uh, building of clipper ships built one of every four clipper ships in America. So these were guys who were very prolific and very skilled and provided some of the fastest ships that were ever built. Um, actually, one of Donald McKay's ships, I think it was, held a speed record for almost 100 years. And um, I think all of these four guys built ships somewhere between 50 and 100 ships during their lives. So uh, they were quite prolific. Now in this chart, same names, but I've added their locations and houses in East Boston. You might be interested in this. And it turns out all four of these houses still exist in East Boston. Donald McKay started in Princeton Street, but soon moved over to um, his house at White Street, 78 to 80 White Street. We'll show that on the map in a, in a little while. <clears throat> Uh, Samuel Hall lived uh, down south in Jeffreys Point in East Boston. Paul Curtis was on Meridian Street. Sylvanus Smith started on Utah Street in 1854. And then in 1872, he built, he built his own house. I'm, I'm pretty sure he did because he had built houses before. And he built ships. Um, and it would have been very easy for him to build a house there. But it's a very nice looking house at 76 White Street. You notice that's right next door to Donald McKay. So um, it was, that's, that just fascinated me. Um, next chart is a wonderful image of the shipyards. You'll see in the, and this was from 1855. So this was about a year after Sylvanus arrives. He started working for, well, I'll come back to that in a second. This image is super, it's from a magazine and it shows, um, Carpenters uh, sawing wood, chopping wood in the foreground, planing it in the middle foreground, and then carrying it up this really steep ramp to the top of the ship where they uh, would deposit these uh, timbers and 
lumber and planks and all the things that go into building a ship. And you can see it was pretty far along. The ship was pretty tall and there were three masts there already. Uh, so I would say it looks like that one was probably the furthest along of the ships shown in the shipyard. And if you look carefully in the background, um, just to the left of center is the State House in Boston. And off to the right is Bunker Hill Monument in Charlestown. So this is a delightful portrait. And the article that accompanies this illustration uses the, uh, uses the phrase that there was a glorious rivalry among the builders. And I'm sure that's true, but there was also a lot of teamwork and connections between them. As I mentioned, Sylvanus Hall, Sylvanus Smith came to East Boston and he first started working for Samuel Hall. He then became his foreman and eventually uh, they were related by marriage. Uh, Sylvanus and Judith Smith's daughter Mary married Luke Hall. He was the grandson of Samuel Hall's brother. So there was family connections there as well. And then I should mention that uh, Paul Curtis, who's one of the other four shipbuilders that I mentioned, uh, he and Sylvanus went into partnership later, um, later in their careers. So uh, this gives you a great idea of what the shipyards looked at the time. Uh, it was a great harbor there. It was a wonderful place to build ships. It didn't have the limitations that, uh, for example, the North River did at the time. Here's a photo, actually a photo from uh, 1855, I think, about the same time as that uh, etching. And this shows the, the Dan Donald McKay's shipyard at the time. This is courtesy of the Museum of Fine Arts. And here's a picture of an, another photo early from about 18, 1869 near the end of construction of la the last merchant sailing vessel of Donald McKay. It was called the Glory of the Seas. And this, um, uh, this ship looks really huge in this photo. And actually Donald McKay's in the photo, he's right in the center at the bottom, but his back is turned to the camera so you can't really see him. Um, what should I say? You could you can make out what may be what probably is the figurehead for this at the prow of the ship. And this was a carved by a guy named Gleason, who was a famous uh, carpenter, well, ca famous carver at the time. He did things other than figureheads, but he also did, he was famous for his figureheads. And he also carved the figurehead for Sylvanus Smith's Centennial. Uh, that ship was built 1875, six years later. And I want to thank the uh, Boston College Department of History for this photo. It's in the public domain, but it's at this great website. I recommend all of you, especially those from East Boston, to check on Global Boston. Um, you can Google that and then look for the East Boston article on it. It's a really terrific description of um, East Boston's history. So um, I mentioned that uh, Gleason carved the figurehead for Smith Centennial, and here's a delightful oil painting of the Centennial. It was built in 1875. I'm pretty sure that the name was in honor of the nation's centennial coming up in 1875, 1876, with the uh, 100 years after the signing of the uh, Declaration of Independence. The center for this celebration was in Philadelphia and in 1875 they were busy at work getting ready for the uh, what was really the first country's first world's fair to celebrate the uh, country's founding a hundred years before and it, feel, uh, uh, it was uh, appropriate that the first place for this boat to uh, to voyage to was Philadelphia and they spent some time there I don't want to come back to that in a second is an amusing story related to that. It was really designed to run between uh, Philadelphia and California and San Francisco uh, back and forth, but it soon uh, took a trip off to England where this painting was made. It also went to Hong Kong. Uh, there was an oil painting of this that was in the family for a while. And um, it eventually wound up in San Francisco running uh, it's kind of a come down from its glory years of 
running a, around the uh, around the globe. It was running salmon between Alaska and San Francisco. And I found that its figurehead is in a museum in the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. I'd dearly love that to get on display someday and get some nice photos of it. But I do have a photo of it in storage that's on my website if you want to take a look at it. Um, the next year after the, oh, before I go to the next year, um, Judith Smith has her diaries in the Mass Historical Society, and she wrote about this ship. Uh, she said she'd gotten a letter from her husband saying that the Centennial ship had beat everything. In other words, had gotten to Philadelphia before all the other ships. And the pilot at, in the harbor in Philadelphia said it was the finest ship that ever came up the Delaware River. Um, and I imagine that pilot saw a lot of ships at the time. So that was quite a compliment. I think Sylvana Smith was really noted for building excellent ships. Um, the amusing story that goes along with this is that the day of the, uh, the ship left Boston Harbor, um, they had a kind of a party, uh, a receiving party for um, family and friends. Some of the people like Sylvanus was going on the ship, the ship's captain and uh, his wife were on the ship and a few other people. And then uh, Sylvanus and Judith Smith's family were there to see it off. They got to tour the boat before they left. And somehow their daughter, Mary, uh, had locked herself in a closet on the ship and uh, wound up sailing away with the ship, even though she was not supposed to be one of the passengers. Um, and I guess they heard her shouts later on and unlocked her and she made the uh, trip down to Philadelphia. And her father was delighted. Her mother was furious. But a week later, as her diary shows here, that she would calm down and she was happy to hear that uh, both Savannah and Mary had made the trip all right. They had been sick, but they were, had gotten better by the time they got to Philadelphia. Uh, this story is covered in my, a subchapter of my book called The Stowaway, and uh, I recommend it. It's one of my favorite parts of the book. Okay, so next year he built the Paul Revere, which is shown here in a fine painting that's in the Massachusetts Historical Society. And um, I should mention this was built by the firm of Smith and Townsend at the time. Uh, they were occupied the site of, uh, of, well, we'll get to that in the maps, but um, uh, Smith and Townsend uh, built a lot of uh, uh, the ships that uh, Sylvanus was famous for. And this ship made it from Boston to San Francisco in four and a half months. Sounds like a long time. Uh, there were no airplanes at the time. I think there were no really good trains uh, at the time and they would have taken a while. Um, but it's really not that out of line with what other ships were doing at the time. Now just compare this to the record uh, for New York to San Francisco, which was 89 days in 1854 that was set by Donald McKay's Flying Cloud ship. And this ship um, wound up traveling the world. It went to Kobe in Japan, in Shanghai, in China, Manila, Bombay in India, and it wound up in Australia. And I think that's where it uh, eventually ended. It was kind of uh, repurposed for other purposes and uh, there are some photos of it that I've also put on my website. Um, uh, I think I'm pretty sure they're the ship, but I'm not an expert. As I said, I'm not an expert on this, so I can't be sure that they are uh, the same ship, but they certainly had the same name. So that's the Paul Revere. Now to the maps. Um, this is a wonderful 1851 map, courtesy of the Leventhal Center at Boston Public Library. Let's start with Donald McKay's house. It's circled with the letter, uh, with the circle zero in the kind of the top left there. Uh, on this map, he's the only one on that block, the only one within a block, so he was kind of on his own in 1851. Next to it is this rectangular area. That was a reservoir and is now the site of Boston High School, Boston, East Boston High School. A lot of people in East Boston are probably very familiar with that. 
uh, and this would be the house next to it or one house over from East Boston High School. And if you go down into the left, that's White Street. Uh, at the end of White Street, the foot of White Street, because you're going downhill, uh, you see the yards along the waterfront there. And the first yard you come to is the Curtis Yard. That's Paul Curtis, who was born, born in Situate. Almost next to him was Donald McKay's shipyard. And then go along the waterfront further, and this is along Border Street in East Boston. And you come to the shipyard of uh, Samuel Hall. Uh, Samuel got there early and his shipyard was there uh, for uh, the longest period of time. Um, Donald McKay's shipyard moved around a little bit. Uh, we'll see that in the next map. Uh, but I, yeah, this, this is a little detail about the move in late in 1851 after that map was published. He had to move it because the city was moving extending Border Street a little bit. I mention this just because there's a great website. I've put the link here. It's by a guy named, uh, uh, well, it's a memoir of Bruce Lane, uh, who talked all about the flying cloud. And it really has a lot of great detail about Donald McKay and his shipbuilding activities in East Boston. So after 1851, you can see on this map, we jump ahead to 1866. This is shortly after the end of the Civil War. Donald McKay had been building uh, ships for the government down at his shipyard, which you see is much further down um, Border Street, down the waterfront here, actually beyond Samuel Hall's shipyard. And now uh, Sylvana Smith has entered the picture. Um, I've got an arrow pointing to it, but it's also on the map. You can't really read it too well in this map, but his name is on that on the map there. And the Curtis Yard is uh, at the top, still the same spot at the foot of White Street. And we move ahead to the 1874 map. Uh, you've got to reorient yourselves because north is to the right and the uh, Boston proper is up uh, to the top. Um, at the bottom of this is the reservoir. Let's move from the bottom up. I guess it's easier. Uh, at the bottom is the reservoir. It's shown in green here. Uh, one house up from that on White Street is Donald McKay's house. One house further up from that is Sylvanus Smith and Judith Smith's house. And then you just go up, up from there and you reach uh, Border Street and the shipyard of um, Smith and Townsend. And it says lessee, I think they were leasing it from, uh, probably from Samuel, um, from uh, Curtis. Uh, this is Curtis, this map's courtesy of the State Library of Massachusetts, and it's just a small uh, segment of the total map. But it's got a lot of nice detail in it. And then the 1879 map, which uh, shows up quite often, but it's just a wonderful map. It shows all of East Boston, uh, the area that we've been looking at is the lower left part. That's where the uh, Sylvana Smith ship, shipyard is, almost um, in the corner of the lower left. If you go up White Street from there, you can see the big rectangular area, which was the uh, reservoir at the time. And actually, this bird's eye view shows both uh, McKay's and uh, Sylvana Smith's house, although they're pretty small and probably not exactly to scale, but uh, they're in that photo. And you can see off to the right, there are flats there, which were laid out for streets with streets which had not been filled in yet. And then off to the right are all the shipyards for passenger ships. That was where the Cunard line uh, came from Boston to, from uh, England to Boston. Uh, that was established actually in the 1840s and it was lasted for quite a while. Uh, their headquarters were in Boston on State Street, um, and the building that they had for their headquarters is still there. Um, so this is a terrific over uh, bird's eye overall view of East Boston at the time in 1879, and uh, it shows the uh, shipyards in full full bloom at the time. So uh, the Smith House is shown here. This is a recent Google photo. And it's in really good shape. They 
renovated a couple of years ago. Uh, before that, it had like aluminum siding on it and other things that were not that uh, not that nice looking. I think now they've restored it to pretty close to its original appearance. Some of the original appearance can be seen in photos that are in the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society and the Duxbury Rural and uh, and uh, Historical Society uh, files of uh, the Smith family. Uh, Judith Windsor Smith is the uh, key to look for in those collections. So off to the right, you see uh, what's peeking out from under the trees is uh, the McKay house. These are, there are 13 columns. There are one for each of the col original colonies of the United States. And that's on the National Register of Historic Places. So it's just a terrific building. But uh, somehow the building next to it uh, never got documented too well. Uh, until I came along and then documented that in the state uh, database called, uh, which I mentioned before, called MACRIS, M-A-C-R-I-S. Uh, but uh, they're still there on White Street, right next next to each other. You notice this is an Empire style, style building with the uh, mansard roof at the top and then um, dormer windows sticking out of the top floor. So, um, Let's turn the page to suffragists. Uh, I, as I mentioned, the woman on the right is uh, Judith Smith, who was an early suffragist. She was dear friends with the woman on the left, who's Lucy Stone, one of the nation's top suffragists uh, from Boston and Jamaica Plain, I think. Um, and uh, her daughter, shown in, in the photo here with her baby daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell. Um, Lucy had married Henry, Henry Stone, Henry Blackwell, and uh, Lucy and Henry and Alice were all really important suffragists uh, in the Boston area. Lucy noted mostly for uh, uh, forming the American Woman Suffrage Association about 1869, 1870. In 1870, she started the Woman's Journal, in Bo which was published in Boston continuously weekly from 1870 to 1917 and in New York thereafter. Uh, this was the means by which the suffrage message got out to everybody, including uh, as far out as California and other places. It was probably the, the top suffrage um, uh, publication in the country for many, many decades. And it was headquartered in Boston near the State House. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, uh, here's a sorry for the, all the words, but you know Judith has quite the resume, and I could have barely squeeze it all on here. But in 1875, she founded the Home Club of East Boston. It was just the second women's club in Massachusetts, and one of the earliest ones in the country. And she served as its president for 10 years. And in her first year, she invited some, and this club was all about inviting speakers to educate people and to provide uh, some social gatherings. Uh, in the first year, she invited Julie Ward Howe and Mary Livermore as speakers. And uh, Mary uh, wound up being the first editor of the uh, Women's Journal, actually, for a year or two before Lucy Stone uh, took it back over again. Um, but she was an important person. And uh, you can tell by this, uh, and I don't think I found a lot of documentation between these, all these people, but Julia and Mary Livermore and Judith uh, were all very close. In fact, Mary Livermore also taught school in Duxbury, and I believe that's where she met her husband as well. So they had, she had a lot in common with Judith. Um, by 1881, Judith was a member of the Mass Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, she was president of the East Boston Women's Suffrage League. She was honorary, honorary president of the New England Women's Club. Uh, women's clubs, by the way, were pretty closely allied with the suffrage movement. Um, uh, not that they had the same goals, but um, they shared a lot of the same memberships and they were probably sympathetic uh, with each other's goals. 
And later on, uh, Judith was a member of the executive committees of the Massachusetts Suffrage Association, the New England Suffrage Association, and the American Women's Suffrage Association. So usually these get uh, abbreviated, but uh, I've given the full terms here. And in 1899, and now remember, by this time, she's 78 years old. If I did my math right, yeah. She's, uh, she presided over the Mass Women's Suffrage Association uh, meeting and was elected their member uh, to the executive committee of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. And in 1915, when um, the suffragists were uh, promoting a referendum in Massachusetts and other Northeast states to gain suffrage for women, um, she was in a huge parade in Boston, it was called a victory parade, and uh, it stopped in, at, in front of the state house and she got to meet uh, uh, Mayor Curley. Well, maybe it was in front of the city hall, I don't know, but she got to meet Curley. He presented her with a bouquet of, of red roses. So um, she had dealings with some important people, not the least of which was in 1921. After she got to vote for president, she met President Harding down in Plymouth uh, she got to tell him that she had cast her vote for him, and he was very pleased with that. <clears throat> and she got to tell him that he, she had spent 70 years working for women's suffrage. So sorry for the long resume, but uh, boy, I've left out a lot of stuff about Judith and her involvement in the suffrage movement. Um, here's an interesting uh I guess photograph, it's a composite photograph. So not all these people were there at the same time. So it kind of early, I guess it's bef way before Photoshop, but somehow these photographers were able to put all these people together in 1884 in this composite photo uh, by the Notman Studios. And of these 12 people, there's three I wanted to highlight, Mary Livermore, who I've mentioned, uh, Louisa May Alcott, author of Little Women, uh, and Julia Ward Howe. Um, Mary and Julia were suffragists and they were friends of uh, Jud Judah Smith. Uh, Louisa and Julia were early members of the Parker's, Theodore Parker's 28th Congregational Society of Boston, uh, as were Judith and Savannah Smith. Um, again, I don't have correspondence between them to confirm this, but they all were all early members of the congregation. It turns out this was a kind of a spin-off of the Unitarian Church. Theodore Parker became enormously popular in the 1840s and 1850s. He and his congregation met at various places in downtown Boston, and the congregation uh, became the largest one in the largest congregation um, in, in Boston at the time. Uh, later, after his death, the congregation had uh, stayed together and they built this building called the Parker Memorial Building. Uh, it's at the corner of Boylston and Appleston, Appleton Streets. And it's still there. And uh, believe it or not, it was never documented in the state database called MACRIS. And until I came along and about a month or two ago, I uh, documented the history and the architectural features of this building. Uh, it's not yet uh, in Macris, but if you go to my website, you can or email me, and I can send you a link to um, my documentation of this building. But it looks just like that today. They did a great job preserving it, um, and it's a wonderful example of architecture of the time. And the second floor, you can see on this. This is a stereo view, so um, it's a pretty much the same picture on both sides. But if you look at the second story in the back, you can see four windows that are really tall that really cover about a story and a half, if not two stories. This was a big meeting hall. It could hold up to 800 people at a time for uh, basically religious meetings or uh, musical programs or other things. Um, so we talked about um, where Judith and Sylvanus worshipped and where they lived. And now we talk about where Judith worked. Uh, this shows, this is a great photo of downtown Boston of Park Street. Um, 
Park Street starts on the right with Park Street Church. It runs to the left up the hill to the State House in Boston, and to the left is Boston Common. Uh, the structures you see on the left are for the subway that were built, that was built at the time. And uh, let's see, on the right you can see Tremont Street that runs along the uh, Boston Common. And the reason I chose this photo, I mean, I, I like this photo too, but uh, this actually shows the buildings that uh, the Women's Journal was in and various suffrage organizations at the time. And it's really halfway between Park Street Church and the State House. Halfway between the two, you see a kind of a light colored group of buildings. There were two or three buildings kind of stuck together. And that was their home at the time. Now remember, I had mentioned the Women's Journal had been started in 1870. It actually started in the same block uh, in Boston. Uh, it's around the corner from the Boston Athenaeum. And it moved around a couple times, but its home for a pretty long time was there at 3 to 5 Park Street. That building has now been replaced, um, but the, the spot is still there. The Park Street Church is still there, and I think uh, some of the other buildings, like Number 9 Park Street, is still there, the site of a wonderful restaurant today. Um, I guess the, the, all, the suffrage organizations that were there were the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Organization uh, Association and a couple others that were important. They were there until 1902 uh, and then um, the Wall Street, I mean the Women's Journal, sorry, Women's Journal was there until 1908 uh, and then most of them moved out to a place at 585 Boylston Street which is still there. Uh, but this shows you back in the uh, formative years of the suffrage movement. Okay, so that was where Judith worked and where she spent summers was here in Situate, uh, where I'm speaking from. This shows the uh, Situate Lighthouse uh, Lightkeeper's Cottage. Uh, it shows it in winter, so not, nothing's happening at the time. Uh, it was closed for the winter, um, but in summer they were allowed to use this uh, keeper's cottage and stay there for their summer vacations. and. Uh, these are mentioned in the Judith Smith Diaries, which are in the Massachusetts Historical Society. They confirm that they were spending summers here from the early 1870s, probably um, just for Fourth of July and a few other days. But by the end of the 1800s, they were spending the whole month of July there. And they had such privileged access because they were not only friends of, but I guess in a way related to Samuel Hall's son, also named Samuel Hall. He was a shipbuilder in East Boston. And he, in 1873 was, um, and I'm not sure how this happened, but he was uh, designated as the lighthouse keeper for the Situate Lighthouse. Actually, it was no longer a lighthouse at the time because the uh, Minus Ledge Lighthouse had been built by then. And so this was, basically abandoned, but there was some um, damage to the place. So the federal government named uh, Samuel Hall Jr. to take care of this place and be its caretaker. The records about um, its existence at the time were destroyed, but the index cards for these uh, documents have survived. And that's how we know that Samuel Hall was the one who was taking care of this. And uh, he lived in East Boston. He was a shipbuilder and, you know, again, he was related by marriage and uh, by close friendship with the uh, Judith and Sylvanus Smith and their whole family. So that's how Judith and Sylvanus and their family came to uh, Situate. And they were there until probably about 1890, 90, 91 or so. Um, oh, back to this, sorry. I, I, if you see in this photo, it's closed up for winter, but on the um, right side, there's this strange looking thing that looks like a one of these old fashioned clotheslines with kind of a curved uh, network of wires or cables or something on the top. And it's right in front of the lighthouse. That shows up here, and this is a 
actually a canopy that was built by uh, Sylvanus Smith. And um, you can see now it looks like ship, it looks like timbers, basically four timbers covered with a uh, striped canopy roof and a lot of lines there uh, to uh, pull, open it up and close it because for the summer you needed some protection from the sun. There weren't a lot of trees at the time, even though this was called Cedar Point. I think there were not too many cedars left. It's called Lighthouse Point more commonly today. And you can see in the background is actually First Cliff for those of you from Situate, uh, uh, you, that's First Cliff in the background. But the people here, it's great. It's a great photo. I got this from the Duxbury uh, Rural and Historical Society. I think the guy in the hat near the center is Sylvanus Smith. His wife Judith is in there somewhere, and these people are described as uh, friends from Duxbury. So um, it was quite a gathering. They love to have people over and visit them at the lighthouse. And then um, the lighthouse was occupied uh, by a full-time lighthouse keeper or full-time caretaker. So at that year, at that time, 1896 is when um, Sylvanus built a cottage just about seven houses away from the lighthouse. It's shown here and it's the second uh, cottage from the left. It's two and a half stories tall. It's about the tallest one there. And there are photos, I'm not sure I put a, um, let's see, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess I didn't put a postcard in here, but it survived the uh, blizzard of 1896, which leveled about half of the cottages that were out there. And a lot of, there are a lot of photos of the destruction from that storm. It's called the Portland Gale, after a ship that uh, got destroyed and killed a lot of people, um, the Portland um, but that, uh, that destruction saved, for, or it went by the Smith Cottage. Maybe Sylvanus was just a great builder, or maybe they were lucky at the time. Um, but anyway, that's where they uh, spent summers after uh, getting out of the lighthouse. And that house is still there. And that's one that I've added some documentation to in the Macris. Um, real nice family spend summers there. Okay, Judith, um, meanwhile, uh, she was kind of associated with the Women's Journal and she actually was the subject of a story there in 1894. She went out to the Minot's Ledge Lighthouse, which then as now is uh, in operation. I think it's still in operation anyway. And you can see a photo of it on the right. It's just kind of stuck out in the water and halfway up this tall building is the entrance. And she had to be, she went out uh, to visit. She had to be hauled up there. And uh, when she got there, she was um, greeted by the lighthouse keepers. And they said she was the oldest visitor who had ever been hoisted up to the lighthouse there. And through her calling, she brought along copies of the women's journal, uh, which she left with the lighthouse keepers. She was a true promoter of the suffrage cause. Um, you can see this gives you kind of a, a spotty overview of the suffrage movement. In 1862, Judith and Sylvanus were already anti-slavery advocates and they were, I think they were early uh, advocates of William Lloyd Garrison. I couldn't find any documentation that they were that they were uh, that close, but they did contribute to uh, his cause. And then later on, they were friends with uh, Garrison's son, who was also named William Lloyd Garrison. And that movement was really kind of a, the genesis of a lot of the suffrage movement. A lot of the same people moved from the anti-slavery um, movement to the uh, women's suffrage movement. Uh, they, had, they had actually promoted the uh, uh, African-American suffrage movement and the 15th Amendment gave them that. Um, some of the African-American uh, promoters said it's not the women's hour now, the women's hour is later. Who knew that it would take from 1870 to 1920 for the women's hour to come, but that's the length of time it took. And for all that time, um, Judith was 
promoting and involved in, deeply involved in the suffrage movement. So uh, she really deserves a lot of credit for her, for her involvement. But I got to say, Sylvanus was the first one to have, that I could find to have a, an office, be, be elected an officer of a suffrage organization. And this was the newly organized East Boston Women's Suffrage Club in 1878. That was skip way ahead in 1913. There was a suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. The first, uh, really uh, first demonstration of its kind in, in uh, our country's history. And it was a huge success, partly because a lot of the women were uh, brutalized by the, uh, the men that were in the mobs surrounding the parade. Uh, but it was a, a, a key moment in the suffrage movement. And then in 1915, I mentioned there was a referendum on the women's right to vote in Massachusetts, New York, a couple other Northeast states, and it was defeated in each one. In Massachusetts, it was defeated by, and this was defeated by men voters only, defeated by a uh, ratio of two to one. Uh, New York also defeated it, but the next year uh, or two years later, they uh, passed a referendum giving women the right to vote. But Massachusetts marched on without giving uh, the right to vote. Meanwhile, down in Washington, D.C., um, uh, Alice Paul and her kind of breakaway um, American women's, uh, women's Party um, staged uh, demonstrations in front of the White House at Lafayette Square. And at first, these were um, just silent sentinels, and they were... Uh, very quiet and peaceful. Later that year, in April or May, the United, the United States entered World War I. A lot of people thought this was un, uh, un-American for these people uh, to be promoting women's suffrage and protest, basically protesting in front of the White House. And still later in, in that year and on into the next couple years, uh, some of the women were arrested and brutalized in jails and detention houses outside of Washington, uh, outside of Washington D.C. And this was also um, led in a kind of a backhanded way, led to some sympathy for the uh, suffrage movement. But it took until 1920 for uh, the 19th Amendment to pass, which gave women the right to vote. So it took a long time. And um, Judith got her uh, publicity. Here's a great article from the Boston Globe, which said she, she's gonna go vote even if it rains. Uh, she said, there's a lot of excuses for not going to the polls, but I've worked for 70 years for the right to do that and I'm gonna go vote, which she did. So just to conclude, and I've got a few more charts, but uh, what have we talked about? Or what have we learned here, I think? Is East Boston was a major shipbuilding center, of course, in the 1850s, and it went well beyond that. Many shipbuilders came from the South Shore, whether it was Duxbury, Situate, or other places. Uh, the, the homes of the shipbuilders in East Boston still exist there, and I hope they're preserved. The uh, Smiths were key suffragists, both of them from early on. Um, and I should mention they were East Boston residents from 1852 on to the rest of their lives. And Judith Smith persisted in the fight for women to vote from the 1870s to 1920. They say history doesn't, um, doesn't repeat. I say it echoes. We see a lot of echoes um, even today. This year, um, the suffrage movement for women was all about who could vote, whose votes counted, and we've had so much discussion about that in, during the presidential campaign and the presidential campaign, uh, pr presidential election of, of this year. Um, and just less than a month ago, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris uh, gave an appearance with the, uh, the, the president-elect and she wore white. And this was a nod to the suffragists of a hundred years before who wore white during their uh, parades and so forth. And another echo from the past, State Street Bank's logo. Uh, State Street is still headquartered on, on State Street in Boston, but they're 
really a, a national force these days. But their logo is still a clipper ship with uh, four levels of sails here. Um, so here we see an echo from the past uh, from East Boston. There's more information available. You can read more about it in my book. It's available on Amazon. Uh, locally here in Situate, Buttonwood Books is carrying this. Um, check out Macris, if you will, great source of information. Uh, I documented a lot of this uh, at bos.jk. Um, that's the Eagle Hill Historic District documentation. Um, I mentioned the Boston College website. Uh, Regina has a great book, uh, very readable, Legendary Locals of East Boston, um, a technical book by Crothers. Uh, Stephen Ujifusa has uh, Barons of the Sea. That's also very readable. It's not all about uh, Donald McKay, and it's not all about East Boston, but they do make some uh, grand appearances in the book. And then my website has tons of information. If you go on the tab under suffrage or suffragists, um, it's uh, lylenyberg.com. I got lots of material, actually including a couple recipes from Judith Smith. So for those of you from East Boston, there's an old, uh, some old recipes there that she, uh, she did for the suffrage movement. And that's the end of my presentation. I, as an author now, I'm wondering, so, I mean, I think the amazing, wonderful thing about it is that um, you had an interest and you spun it into a book. Did you look yeah. to research first and have an idea that's what you wanted to do? Or has this been researching and this different things and this is where it took you to your book? Uh, well, it's been one side project after another. So I get, I really get sidetracked. So I, I, without going back too far, I was in the midst of writing a, enough material for two history books on Situate. And about uh, July of last year, I said, you know, some of these people were involved in the su women's suffrage movement. And I know next year is going to be important. 2020 is going to be the centennial of the 19th Amendment. So maybe there's a book here. And I started researching that. And I came across Judith and Sylvan Judith's papers really in the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. And it just opened up a whole new door. So I have to give Judith and Sylvanus credit for inspiring me to really carry through with the project of writing a book. And I thought, you know, it would take a couple months. And I, I because I'd done a lot of research already, and I already I thought I'd be done, you know, two months later. And it turned out to be a lot longer than that. So by uh, July, July of this year, early July, I think I had what I was pretty happy with. And it's fully footnoted there's I think about 700 footnotes in the book um, and then it took about a month or two to get it to actual publication and that's a whole different process but anyway that's that's my story I guess um, I have to I have to give credit to Judith and Sylvana Smith really for helping me create this book. So maybe they should be co-authors on this. <laughs> Fantastic. We do have another question. Yeah. Did George Lawley have his shipyard near the others? Um, yeah, uh, I didn't run across Lawley as a shipbuilder in East Boston, but he may well have been there. Uh, I've run across his name because he did build ships in Situate, I think in Situate Harbor. Uh, then I think he moved away from uh, Situate Harbor, moved up north. I'm not sure it was Boston or one of the other shipbuilding communities. And I think he focused more on smaller ships. But it's quite possible he was one of the shipbuilders in East Boston. I did not, I, I, you know, I was focused in this talk on uh, those top four shipbuilders that I've listed and I didn't try to do a comprehensive list of shipbuilders in East Boston. There's other people that have done that kind of work. So, um, so yeah, the answer is no, I didn't run across his name. Yeah, it's, it's nice for us to hear it. We love hearing about Donald McKay, of course, but he's the main one that I always hear about. So <laughs> it's nice to, to bring in some more um, 
of the East Boston Shipbuilders. That looks like the only question we have. Um, you know, I'd like to thank you so much for coming and doing this presentation. I'm going to put sure. on my video. It was wonderful. Great. Um, well, thank you. Actually, if other people want to put on their videos or want to, you know, turn their mic on and and um, say hi, we can do that, and then we'll close out. But we really appreciate the program. Um, let me <laughs> unmute everybody. Sorry. <laughs> um, Zoom. It's uh, we're still getting the hang of that, but. Um, you know, this was wonderful to have. Um, I wish it was in person. Um, and I hope that all the participants enjoyed it. Um, you know, if anybody ever has any suggestions for programming, we would love that at the library. And Lyle, hopefully, maybe someday we'll have you back for another program when we're actually physically open, because we would, we would love to have a recap again, I think. Um, well, I love libraries and I've gotten to really like East Boston. So, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I should add, uh, yeah, please people uh, get in the chat line or send in your questions. And I also we're planning to record this and it should pop up on YouTube. And I guess probably the best way is uh, to find out is check my website, lylenyberg.com or check the Facebook page for the East Boston Public Library, uh, which had uh, publicized this talk. So I want to thank, again, thank you, Margaret, for the great work you've done in uh, setting this up. Thank and it's, it's been a lot of fun. I hope it was uh, uh, enjoyable and educational for people in East Boston. It was absolutely great. And another thank you again to Deborah with the Friends of the Library and with the East Boston um, Historical Society and Museum. And let's hope someday we have a museum in East Boston. Um, yeah. It was great. And I guess that is it. Um, unless anybody has any last questions. And if you do, you could unmute yourself as well um, to ask them, I think so. I have a question. Okay, Robert, yes? Lyle, um, suffragettes and uh, federal income tax, um, they were kind of related a little bit, right? Prohibition, income tax, and suffragettes. Didn't they sort of work together? Because if you, you had to, um, the biggest tax was on alcohol. So when you had prohibition, you had to make money somewhere. So they came up with federal income tax. And in order to get that, they told the women they would get the right to vote. Is that, did you find that at all in your research? Well, what I found is there, there was some overlap between the suffrage movement and the women's Christian temperance movement, which uh, was uh, designed to outlaw alcohol. Um, there was overlap in um, membership there and some of the uh, and some of the women suffragists thought they were hurting the women's suffrage cause because uh, what the women's temperance movement did was cause all the uh, businesses that relied on alcohol, bars and uh, distillers and so forth, to lobby against uh, any kind of uh, help for women's suffrage. They were afraid that once women got the vote, then they would. Uh, uh, vote in favor of prohibition. And as it turned out, prohibition uh, came into effect, I think in 1919. And, and maybe it was anyway, it was just a year or two before uh, the women got the vote throughout the country. So there, that's the connection I found. I didn't find uh, one to the federal income tax, which I think went back earlier in the 1900s. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, I see a bunch of people in the chat thing, but I don't know if there are questions or it looks like happy, happy comments. <laughs> well, thank you for your comments. Lyle? Yes. Sorry, I'm in a dark room, so I don't show. I'm John Bartels, and oh. you've been dealing with my sister Jennifer some. Yes. My grandmother was one of three children of Jenny Smith, who was the youngest of the Smith children. And she got divorced and moved back to the house in, on White Street. And uh, 
my grandmother, I got to visit the house when it was still an apartment building with her. And it was uh, basically an apartment house or broken into smaller apartments. Yep. And uh, she told the story, she went to Simmons and she said if she, if she didn't take the trolley from Simmons to the ferry, no. she would save a nickel and could go to Bailey's ice cream. <laughs> and growing up, I was always impressed that she walked all that distance from the Fenway to uh, Bailey's and then east and then to the ferry slip. But it turns out at that point, Simmons was not in the Fenway, but was in Back Bay. Right. So it's just a little story that goes with that. But I've sort of wondered the picture that you showed of the Smith group at the lighthouse under the tent, whether the baby in the picture might have been my great grandmother, Jenny. Oh. <laughs> so just, uh, but you've been dealing with my sister, Jennifer. Right. Who's named after Jenny. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is filling in a lot of pictures. <laughs> Also, Judith was on the board of the 28th church, the governing board. And she finished her life in Jamaica Plain, living with one of the other sisters, Zilpha Smith, who never married. And Zilpha was one of the founders of the School of Social Work at Simmons. Wow. Great. So, any other questions for Lyle before we wrap it up? I think we're, I think we're all set. Thank you so much, Lyle. Thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we hope to be doing some more programming this winter. <laughs>